start today uh, about 35,000 feet up. Uh, we see, you know, most recent news, Nordstrom, Dinkin, Balco, and Private. Uh, you've seen all the changes happening over the last year. How do you look at what's happening in the retail world right now and how it impacts how you run your business day to day? Thank you. You know, I, um, I certainly don't think we're in the midst of a retail apocalypse. Apocalypse. I do not believe that. And I do not believe Amazon is killing retailers. I think retailers' bad service is killing retailers. And, um, you know, I think because of that, when you go to, you might not go to the mall as often as you used to. Um, for us, we see it as an opportunity because we've always been famous for our service. At the same time, we don't want to rest on our laurels and say we have this. So we keep innovating around service. So for example, we just linked our design services that we do per brand into what we're calling design crew so that we can go into your home, let's say you want me to furnish your children's room. But while we're there, we will do the entire room with our design crew. And so you want to get more human as yes. things are getting more digital. I mean, I, I firmly believe that most purchases are still made on an emotional basis. And our connection with our customer is our secret sauce. And that is going to be the big differentiation point against whomever we're competing with. And you know, I think. Um, it's not, as I said, it's not a retail apocalypse. I do think that it's a culling of the herd. And no, no difference than when we were in the recession mm -hmm. and you saw a lot of retailers have a really tough time. We came out stronger. But I'm going to push back on that because I think it's a lot different now yeah, sure. because I think people's actual behaviors have changed. I, like I think about my own purchase habits. I, I, I literally was inside a mall for the first time in years the other day. It's similar to movie going habits, all kinds of things. Um, and I was like, oh, I remember this kind of thing. And I, I remember spending enormous Did amounts, you miss it? not even slightly. Um, so have one you, of the have you recently decorated your home? Yes, I do it all the time. But and you did it all online. All online, and yeah. it was fascinating because I was thinking, like now with the purchase of Whole Foods, because I'm that demographic, mm -hmm. um, that essentially I should just hand my paycheck over to Jeff Bezos at this point. You know what I mean? Like here you go. Um, so talk about what, when you're saying what they did wrong, like we, obviously they've missed secular trends that people aren't using malls, that, that, that they like having things delivered to their house, aside from the insane sanity of boxes, that it's, a, it's the way people think about things. So can you talk yes, about I mean, I what the... All retail is not the same. I think it's very easy to buy socks online or even a dress that I might wear once. But when you go to furnish your house, it is a multi-touch you know, dimensional experience. Mm -hmm. And most people, I mean, you, you probably are good at it, but most people want a little help. Hence, the world of interior designers has, is still alive and well. And um, people want reassurance that they're buying the right thing. And it's a, no matter where you buy the product, even if you buy the cheapest furniture, if you redo a room, it's probably a couple thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And so there are two businesses, I just read a report, and I wish I knew which it was, but there are two businesses that are most um, uh, tra uh, tr transacted at retail still. One is food and the other is home furnishings. Makes perfect sense, right? Because those, those are the business that are higher touch. And um, we see it as a huge, as our key advantage actually in differentiation point versus everyone else um, who's in the homes uh, only online world. So today I think you have north of 600 stores across yeah. your different brands. So West Elm, Pottery Barn, William Sonoma be being the big three yeah. of your brands. Five years from now, do you have 600 plus stores? Or what, what is happening to that footprint? It depends on how many brands we have, if we have other brands at the time. Right now, we have this new brand, Rejuvenation. I, I don't know if anyone I has just been bought to it. lamps from them online. Thank you. <laughs> Never Thank went you. in a store. That is an authentic right. sponsor. Well, I, I would like to dare you to go to our <laughs> Rejuvenation store, which is right here next to our new Pottery Barn um, in New York. Yeah. I'd and rather not, but okay. It is a great experience. Okay. I promise you, you, it could change your mind. All right, but talk about like what that, what that story experience has to be to draw you in, because we had um, okay. we had uh, Doug McMillan from Walmart on stage a couple uh -huh. years ago, and at the time no one paid attention, but he was talking about going from 100,000 square foot stores to 10,000 square foot stores, and it was sort of, I was like, what? Because I'd covered retail for many years ago, because that was a big shift for Walmart for to think like that. What is the, what, what has, what is wrong in the stores today? And then is it that, that it's in a mall that you have to drive to? Or what are the problems in the stores and what are some of the solutions? I really believe it's a simple service. You know, I mean, 
someone who actually really helps you make the decision, who cares about you. Um, and you know, when that happens, and I'm the kind of person who's walking around not smiling, do you need any help? I do not. You know, I mean, that, I understand that a lot of people walk around that way, mm -hmm. except when someone starts to really get into it with their home, we provide, and we go, we do a huge bulk of our in-store business actually in people's homes. So we, we get to know you. You don't ever want to come to the store again. That's fine, Kara. We will come to your home, and we will redecorate the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that has been a huge uh, differentiator for us, because not a lot of retailers are doing that. And that's new, or that's always? We've been doing it. I, I was trying to figure this out yesterday. I think we've been doing it for nine years, but we keep getting better at it. And now that we're doing it across brand, it's, it's a much richer experience. It's a bit like you have your GP, and then you have your foot doctor. I mean, not everyone can do every room of the house, but you have this person who's your generalist who then connects you with, you know, if you want to redo all the appliances in your kitchen or, you know, if you want to, you know, redo a kid's room, they'll put you in touch with the person and they'll coordinate the whole effort and make sure it arrives perfectly for you. So when I asked about, you know, the store footprint, how many stores, and you said it depends on how many brands. Well, I was being sarcastic, but honestly, it also depends on the, the you know, the malls and the real estate. So we have, Never gone. We've never overstored. We never went into the sea malls. So we're very lucky. With that said, you know, as le we have a lot of leases coming up for renewal, and we have a great chance to reposition. So you'll see if you look at our current um, store foot store movement right now, we are moving from certain malls to others. We're remodeling key stores. We just, as I said, in New York, we just opened Flatiron. We're moving our Pottery Barn Chelsea store. We're changing that into a rejuvenation. And because we have all these multiple brands, we can, try, we can use them experimentally. So what do the stores fun. look like? What did, how do they change? When yeah. you're moving them from, a, like what mall would you move? What a type of mall would so you So for move? example, um, you know, it's a lot of, because we're a destination business and people like to pull up the car and, you know, actually they'll take the furniture away with them. It doesn't, we don't necessarily have to be in a mall. So for example, we have right in our, my hometown, Marin, we have, um, we had a big regional mall, we had the West Elm in the mall, lease came up, they wanted a huge increase. We moved it to a strip center on Highway 101 in Strawberry Village. Mm -hmm. Store is doing 50% more volume at a much higher profit rate. So it's an example of, you know, you, we weren't scared to leave and we were right. And as we continue to do that, we see options to reposition more effectively. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of your brands, West Elm, I think, is, is the fastest, of your big brands, mm -hmm. West Elm is the fastest growing by mm -hmm. far. What does that tell you? I think it's in double digit percentages yep. while the other two big brands are single, single mm -hmm. digit. What does that tell you about what that brand mm -hmm. is doing right? And do you consider things like spinning off a business that's growing as fast as that one is compared to the core? Yeah. No. Um, first of all, all our brands are run independently with a shared platform, um, which is great because we leverage the supply chain, which drives down costs. We leverage our database um, and our personalization marketing is, is very effective because we have multiple brands. West, so no spinoff? No spinoff. West Elm is growing. Um, it has very low brand awareness. And that's a big opportunity. We're like something like 17%. So we know that this is a very large brand. And it's got a lot of engagement. You know, it's one of these brands people love. It's um, you know, very relevant today. The price is sharp. Uh, younger demographic, I'm assuming. It, it, it's slightly younger. It's not as it does. It's it's more of a psychographic, I, you know, if you will. Okay. And it's an urban, smaller space brand. It has multiple aesthetics, and for the price, people really like it. And what 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 is it about that? Because when you're starting to create new, because brands get super tired. I mean, you're thinking. I'm thinking about Crate and Barrel, which started to rejuvenate itself, or Gap, which didn't. Um, what, do you, what do you have to do to do that? What, is, what are you thinking about like today? Because things, sh like, and then brands just pop up like Everlane and others, they just pop up out of nowhere. Um, and and ver are there, they have an appeal to a certain, mm -hmm. especially millennials in the case of Everlane or things yeah. like that. I think, um, you know, we've been going through this refresh of the Williams Sonoma brand pretty effectively. You know, Williams Sonoma is such a, loved brand. At the same time, you don't want to think it's your mother's brand. Yeah. You want right. the young chefs to come in and, yeah. you know, they have to be able to also afford it. Right. So we, we actually changed our logo. Um, we changed our bags. We changed our wrap. You know, that's all <coughs> symbolic of a bigger change to be a vibrant, generous, open brand. 
And we've been working um, a lot with chefs to do different types of collaborations. Uh, for example, we have the culinary stage at Bottle Rock, mm -hmm. you know, which is an amazing event if any of you get a chance to go. And you'll see top chefs on stage with great musicians rapping about food. And that's an example of what we're doing to attract a different demographic, being part of that food ecosystem and that food community. Is it critical to have those chefs sort of back William Sonoma? I mean, when you're, yes. when, when you're thinking of it, I was saying I was at this event with Action Bronson, and it yeah. was so many young people all interested in food, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I thought if he said, buy this set of knives, my son would do it. Exactly. Like in two seconds. And, you know, we, we help them, they help us, and we can feature their restaurant, their recipes. We do collaborations. We've done a lot with Thomas Keller in um, cookware, where we did a TK line, which is amazing, mm -hmm. um, cookware. And so we're really open to however we can better serve the community together. So one big question I have as I see the rise of some pure play digital players in the space. So I'm thinking Wayfair, you know, th there were reports recently Amazon may be building for, um, for facilities strictly for furniture and home decor, I larger items. Is, does brand, th does sort of service and efficiency of delivery matter more than brand does today in home? And if you have a platform that's all about, you know, let's say a wafer that's about price and discovery, uh, does a new generation of shopper care more about that than brand? So I, I think you have to have it all. I mean, why not have a name that you can trust? I mean, particularly if you're buying something online, it's nice to know that the quality is consistent. And regardless of the price, no one wants to receive a piece of furniture that's broken. Even if it's free, after a while, I mean, I don't want a table with a scratch on it in my house. So we're very focused on improving our customer service, and not just in-store, but also the delivery. And um, you know, we just got done with a board meeting. We measured every single piece of our delivery to the customer. Um, we're now having the customers rate us at every single point. What's the biggest challenge in, in that whole logistics process? You know, it's moving large scale furniture is difficult, which is why it's a great competitive moat. I mean, if someone's starting a business, likely they don't go into the furniture business, they go into the bathing suit business or something. It's a lot easier to ship. But if you can do something hard, well, that's an advantage. So we have been at this for a while now, and we're very good at large cube furniture. We keep reducing our supply chain costs, which, by the way, is good for service, and it's good for our investors, and we will continue to focus on it. We see a huge amount of opportunity still um, to, to better our service times, be faster to the customer, and um, reduce the cost. Another, uh, another point I want to make about augmented reality, and obviously it's a topic we're hearing a lot about in the tech yeah. space, Apple's event yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, Google's been all over it. Uh, I believe uh, Pottery Barn has partnered with Google on an augmented reality app. And when I think about all the gimmicks in AR and, you know, retail and VR, you know, I've always thought home is a space where actually augmented reality could make sense. Yeah. So can you just explain a little bit about what, how you think about that space and is it a real differentiator? Yeah, so explain what you're doing with, powder, with yeah. Google right now. Because yeah, yeah. it does feel, a lot of the stuff early on does feel stunt-like. Like, does it, mm -hmm. does it really work? Although when you really do think about it, it should, it should make sense. Yeah, it makes sense. So in the same logic of you need to improve the shopping experience in the stores, you need to improve the shopping experience digitally. And it's hard to decorate a house. People don't have dimensional abilities, you know, like you may. So using AR, VR helps them see the furniture in their space. We want to lead on these things, and we knew that the Tango phone, you know, there's not a lot of them out there. We're great partners with Google. We always have them. We do betas with them all the time. And by the way, by doing those betas, we get great engineers who want to work for us because they want to work on cool things. But we also did it because we wanted to be ready when it came onto the Apple phone. So Tango phone had the depth perceptor that allowed this to happen. And we have over 100 and I think we have 140,000 3D models currently built, which is a lot. So other people have small groups of these things. Um, and that makes it a very thin experience. Mm -hmm. But we can actually take whole collections in this app that we have. You, you, know, you put it over the 
the room, this room, we remove these chairs, we drop down remove the... Remove Jason. We remove you, yep. and we drop down you know, the West Elm workspace product, and then you could see it in the space and consider that. So and it's really um, easy to, to understand. But because you're right in that not a lot of people have Tango phones, nor do they know how to do these, the application that we're trying right now is letting our in-store people use these phones with a customer. So if you were working with me, mm -hmm. or I came to your house, I would say, hey, look, what do you think about this? And it may help you convert. So they would, you, you, you want to get in the home and then take the picture of the room and then create the space. And remove the other furniture. So when you, when you, and remove the other furniture, and what this is what it would look like if we put this here, we put that there and put that there. When you're thinking about these spaces, where do you imagine it going? Because eventually it will be, you'll be in a, is it a VR environment, an AR environment? I just spent some time with Tim Cook. AR is their big interest yeah. over VR. Uh -huh. um, obviously Facebook is in VR, more around entertainment. But what do you imagine for the, in, in commerce, it, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, again, in this move towards no stores, I mean, do you imagine a store list and the, the, a whole store is like that? I think that, you know, there, there are applications like that where you could imagine um, going into a store that wasn't, and there's a virtual store, obviously. Right. Um, but I, I, you know, what I'm focused on right now is putting our application on the Apple phone and making it really easy for people to imagine what different lifestyles, aesthetics. So if we were having a conversation, I asked you, what do you like? And you say coastal, and here's your brownstone, but I think it actually should be more modern. We can just whip through this and help you make a better decision. I need a lot of help with my taste. Yeah. Yeah. So Google, sorry, so just to back up one second. So Google as a testing ground for Apple phones, essentially? Well, I mean, we, we love them all. So we're very happy, we, we do a lot with both of them. And, um, you know, it just so happened that we started it on the Tango. But it, it, it will work. We're going to be, I, I actually texted this morning and said, you know, when are we going to have it live? And they said, say before the holidays. But I'm going to say publicly, 11-1. <laughs> yeah. So when yeah. you're thinking about that, when you're working with those people, do they have a sensibility? Because one of the issues, you know, around entertainment or whatever, or publishing, everyone's had their struggles with these companies, like how, you know, when they're moving into these spaces. Work, how do you, you're talking about working with Working an with, with an Apple or a Google or, I don't, are you working with Facebook at all? Yeah. Yeah, so. We love Facebook. Why is that? It's just fantastic. Meaning? Um, it's such a good way to tell stories about our product. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, when you work with them. And I you, personally love it. When you work with, with them, today the federal government doesn't, I mean the, the Congress is not loving them as much this, this today. Um, when, you, when you are thinking about working with them, how do you approach them? Because a lot of other industries are nervous. And I know that Google's trying to get a differentiation in shopping because of Amazon, they're pushing heavy into that area. Uh, Apple is, is super interested. How do you look at them when you approach them? I mean, it's a big what is your relationship? So, I mean, it's interesting. It's a big change because I think before retailers like us, specialty retailers, you expected everyone to come to you mm -hmm. and you were nervous. And I actually think that you have to stamp out that thinking and say to yourself, I'm going to go wherever my customers are and I'm going to be agnostic. And you can't live your life in a paranoid you know, way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not going to make progress. So if you really want to be innovative, well, we have a testing environment. So we say, if you have a great idea, I hate it, but guess what? You are so passionate about Carrot, let's test it. Mm -hmm. And by doing that kind of thing, we have found some great new ideas that we wouldn't have considered otherwise. And what, what is that, how do you look at that relationship with them? I'm just, I'm curious how you, because it's, again, we're, other we're industry. We're a partner of theirs, and, strategic partner. And, and where does that evolve to? Mm. Who knows? Who knows? Do you look at it as an anti-Amazon move or what? Because I think Google, I was just at Google for lunch and they were saying we are going to be the anti-Amazon people, <laughs> um, essentially. They were not saying that explicitly, although they were kind of saying it explicitly. Um, but they think about it that way, that this is an opportunity, um, which is kind of interesting that a giant behemoth is saying we're going to be your savior for the mm -hmm. other giant behemoth. Um, but, but talk about that, that, how you look at those, especially Amazon, when Amazon sort of over here wanting to eat everything in his path. Mm -hmm. We like Google. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other, you know. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. an, all right. Another tech topic right now that, um, you know, I look for real world applications of is, 
in retail and commerce is AI. And um, again, a lot of gimmicks right now, but I believe, you know, I think your West Elm brand is doing some things with Pinterest with an ARI partnership. I think they're here, Clarify is here, right? They will, they will, right. yeah, that com yeah, that company will be here at some point today. Um, Again, are these are these just experiments, or are no. these critical to your success? Well, so and maybe maybe yeah. explain what that I what mean, that partnership is. Very simply, obviously, we want to predict what you're going to buy. We want to help you under the heading of service. We don't want to serve you marketing that is irrelevant. You know, the worst thing is you bought a dining table. The next day, I'm sending you dining table emails when you already bought one. Yeah, and why does personalization still stink today? It's a good question, but we have made a lot of progress on it. And um, we think it is the future. Personalization, AI is obviously an application to that. I mean, there's so many different ways to use it, but you know, whether it's service chatbots, whether it's um, what we're doing with Pinterest and visual search, which is super cool, I think. Um, obvious, again, obvious application. I love what Clarify is doing, and um, we'll, we'll continue to test and push on this area. Okay, it's, so not, it's not just bright, shiny object. I mean, not interested in those things. It's about improving the shopping experience. Back to how do we win? We win because we have the best service online and in the stores and in your home. And as a retailer based in San Francisco area, do you, does that change how you think about yes. partnership versus yes. in-house ability, uh, mm -hmm. hiring in-house ability? Well, of course, it's very difficult to hire engineers in San Francisco, regardless of who yeah. you are. But um, we, we stay very in touch with all these different tech partners and want to know what's going on. We're very curious, and um, we meet with them a lot. And they help us with a lot of these projects. So how do you look at that? It's interesting, because we were talking about culture backstage. How do you change the actual culture? Um, I was interviewing David Rosenblatt from First Dibs yesterday. Mm. And he's from an engineering and tech background, and so he has the mentality. And one of the things he was talking about in the podcast was like, look, a lot of these retailers hire one or two people and then wonder why they're not successful in the thing. And I know this is sort of an old meme and everyone's gotten into it, but it just seems like they still don't get it. You know what I mean? They're still, they're, it's still slow. It's still, it's sort of like watching the newspaper. It's a, it reminds me of newspaper people hmm. hoping the internet will go away kind of thing. Well, we believe in the internet. No, I get that. I it's get that. actually real. But I mean, talk about the, 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 <laughs> the internets, the kids love it. Um, that's my motto. Um, the, the kids seem to enjoy it quite a bit. Um, you love it more than I anybody. love it more than anybody. It's true. I'm up at, I was up at four in the morning like last night clicking away. Um, I was interested in the Russia issues. Um, so, uh, so it was like, what the hell? Um, so, when you're thinking about changing the culture, like, what has to happen in the retail space? Because it seems as if, uh, you know, and again, using Amazon as the proxy, because it really is. Um, suddenly, there's these, you know, stories about them coming into everything, and they're running, they're they're taking over charts all over the place of where retail is and where Amazon is and stuff like that. So, how do you change the actual mentality and compete? with something like that? What is, like hiring technical people? Yeah, hiring I mean, getting hiring people. diverse people. Right. right. So I mean, bringing in lots of different people um, who aren't your customers, who are your customers, and really listening. I mean, we are a completely customer-centric company. We can't sit around and think that we all know what everyone wants. We have to test it. We have to make sure. We, we have to challenge ourselves. It, but I'm saying in your, it, it, when you're managing it, that, I, understand, yeah. I get that, but what specifically? Like how do you, when you look at your, you, you run a very traditional retail business for a long time. How do you make, how does, how does a CEO make that shift? We, we've, been, we've been at least 40% DTC so you were catalog. catalog. Right, yeah. Oh, forever, so, yeah. you know, since I've been there, we have been that. And so when the internet came along, it was a very natural um, cutover because we already had the supply chain set up, we knew how to ship individually to people's houses, we had the database, the house file, we knew how to do one-on-one -on -one marketing. Um, so we that's had the, the answer about... Assets. It, it, it's not this big transformation in that regard for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now we're 52%, where can that be? I, mean, I don't know, I want the whole thing to grow. So, I mean, percentages are interesting, I don't care where they shop. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right that over time, more people are gonna shop online because the tools will be better, because of AR, VR. You know, because of online decorating resources. And so what do you have to do to your staff? What, it, what has to happen to the staff of these companies? The and including the people in the stores. We have such a great staff and we have really innovative people and um, you know, they're, 
they bring their ideas, and I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not feeling like we're stuck in that regard. And uh, one, one more thing about uh, staffing and recruiting. Has, has your hiring process over the last five years you changed at all either in terms of what you're looking for or who you're looking for, or mm -hmm. how, how have you looked mm -hmm. at that? Um, you know, I mean, we've hired definitely more online people and marketing people and uh, over the last, I'd say, 10 years as a percent total. And, um, you know, we have, we have great people. We have always had um, one of the best gender diversity numbers that exist. I think the last time someone counted, they said no one else even comes close. Mm -hmm. We're very proud of that. We're working on our racial diversity numbers as we speak. We are a big supporter of LGBTQ. And um, those are parts, I know it's not what you're asking, but it's very important to us as part of our culture. We have a culture of performance and a culture of entrepreneurship. And that is what has kept people like me and others interested for so long. So you were remiss if I didn't ask about the, the gender issues, because it's, it's, you are a Silicon Valley, I mean, it's San Francisco company, mm -hmm. so you're impacted by, but you don't consider yourself a tech company, correct? Is that? We're a retailer. Retailer. Multi-channel retailer. Multi-channel retailer. Um, but sort of all retailers are now tech companies now mm -hmm. and vice, vice versa in the e-commerce space. Um, how do you look at that? Because you're in the same hiring pool mm -hmm. there. Obviously, Silicon Valley is being riven mm -hmm. with these issues mm -hmm. that are every day. You're like, are you friggin' kidding me? Like mm -hmm. with some of the stuff that's going on. Uh, this Today was SoFi, mm -hmm. yesterday was Uber. You know, it just continues on and on. Can you talk a little bit about how that manages? Obviously, you have a more uh, a gender diverse area. Mm -hmm. What do you imagine is happening there in being I so can't close? Imagine. We're so lucky. I mean, people come even to a meeting with us. And, you know, I, yes, I'm here with my CFO, female, head of IR, female. We met with investors yesterday. And we, I don't, I'm not thinking about it until other people are pointing it out because we have so many women in top management positions. Right. And we also have plenty of great men. I mean, it's, it's very balanced and it's a civilized situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't happen in my world, yet it's happening everywhere else. So I think that we're getting some top talent because people are sick of that mm -hmm. and they want to come over and work for a company where they love the product and where the culture is welcoming and performance-based. And when you think about that, because you were talking about being in investor meetings and it was not that or yeah. wherever you go, how do you, what do you, what are some, like I, I, I do think, I know it's hard being sort of, there's so few female CEOs, there mm -hmm. just aren't. Um, do you feel like you have to be a leader or you don't want to be or, you know, I've had this debate with Sheryl Sandberg and others. When you are in those positions, you, you carry the extra weight. I mean, I think what's most important is that I do a great job yeah. for the investors and for our company and for, you know, our shareholders. And um, that is the most important thing. And when that happens, everybody stops thinking about gender. Um, but certainly I'm not dismissing the fact that it's a reality. And it's hard to get here. And I, I, my advice, I have two girls, I have a boy too, um, to them is, I mean, it's not easy, right? You gotta stick with it. And by the way, it's worth it. And by the way, my kids are just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I always, when women come into my office and tell me they're gonna you know, stay at home because they have to, or da da da, their mother-in-law thinks they should, and this is the best time for them to do it because their kids are so young. You know, I'm the person, I'm the voice that says, hey, listen, I hope you have a good marriage because 50% of you are going to be divorced. And by the way, I'm buying groceries for those women now because they left their career and their mother-in-law is not buying anything for them now. Mm -hmm. So, and they're like, 25, you're like, oh my God, this woman. I said, listen, let me be the other voice of this. Make some money. Mm -hmm. You know, make some money so you can support yourself and you are not dependent. It does, this, this talk does help them see it. And then I, the other piece of it is, well, don't you miss a lot of things? Like, oh my God, you're always traveling. And these kids, I'm like, well, why don't you give one of them a call? Mm -hmm. Give one of my kids a call and ask them. And they'll, they, I mean, I have a 19, 17, 13, right? I mean, of course, right now they're gonna say like, I see her way too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Do they pick up a phone or just type on? They, yeah. Once in a while they do. Yeah. Call me when they need something. Um, but yeah, we're super tight, my kids and I. And um, they don't know any different. Like, I don't know any different. I mean, people say, what's it like to be a working mom? I'm like, I don't know what it's not like. Right. It's right. fine. Right. Right. 
All right, um, I just want to finish on one thing, the retail apocalypse. So you, are for, because there are so, that's really the meme right now, that it's over for retail. There's all, you know, worries about jobs. You don't feel that someday there's not good, I feel that there will not be stores. I, I do. do not agree. Okay. I feel like there's no reason for stores and we should turn them into housing in the San Francisco area in a lot of ways. <laughs> but, um, but you feel like there, 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 there's, there, that there is a store experience because, and I'd like you to answer that and then we'll get to questions. Because people like to be with people and it's a, a great retail, I mean anytime I have that paranoia, mm -hmm. I, I go to South Coast Plaza. Mm -hmm. And I am reminded that great retail, there's nothing like great retail. If you go to Ponce in Atlanta and see this, yeah. you know, the food, people like to eat, so I can't do that virtually. Yeah, not, so, not yet. But go so ahead. let's assume I have to eat still in the future. I do like to look at also pretty things while mm -hmm. I eat. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to also have immediate gratification and take things home. I mean, pretty simple basic needs are met by retail stores, but they have to be fabulous. Right. But you are seeing in malls, for example, I was in a mall this week for the first time in a long time. I saw, all I saw going up were restaurants in, in sort of, you know, the key spots of yeah. the mall. So you have to reimagine, though, in some ways, what gets people there in the first place. Sure. It, or Soul Cycle, or, you know, going to a Williams Sonoma cooking class. Mm -hmm. Maybe Great. We end like yeah. that. All right. Questions from the audience? There's, Please. I think there's a mic. Mic right there. One here. Oh, here comes If you don't mind. Back around. Go ahead. Go, just go to the mic. Stand up. Go ahead. Right here. Sorry. And just tell us who you are. Hi. Jo Jonathan Dunlop from Morgan Stanley. Um, you did $2 billion plus online in sales last year, but do you feel like you know your customer? And what are you doing with that data you're getting to create a single view of the customer and integrate that in the stores? Such a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a, obviously we have a lot of information about our customers and we're using, um, you know, that information to better serve them. So if you bake, if we're doing the job I am expecting us to be doing, we'd be sending you recipes after you buy the baking pans. Um, and we also are looking at customer journeys. So, you know, people are pretty predictable in terms of their life stages. And we know that after you get married, two years later, you're likely to have a kid. You're then going to buy something to live in. And so as we follow you, we can better serve you um, different information. I mean, do we know everything? No. Um, but we know a lot. And it is the key, we think, um, to being relevant always with our customers across brand. How do you communicate with them? Where is the best places now? So there's a lot of different ways. We personalize the homepage uh, based on your preferences. Obviously, we, we personalize emails. We do triggered emails based on what you're buying. Um, you know, we have a lot of activity on social media. Where, what's the most effective one? From your, from effective you, from what perspective? Just in sales. terms of where you, yeah, sales or where you really think. I mean, our websites. Which one? Our websites. Your websites, yeah. not an Instagram or... Well, Instagram, it's a different thing. I mean, Instagram gets a lot of views. Mm -hmm. you know, but the, the, the time they spend on the website researching, reading our content there. The Williamson blog is a great example, really frequented place because it has great content. We have YouTube channels. The videos are also a great way to, you know, how to hang a drape, how to cook a turkey. All those things are... How, how challenging is email today compared, let's talk, five years ago before... Yeah. Gmail promotions inbox or whatever. Uh, it's a, it's a new world. There. You know, it's, it's both been used as, you know, you, you want it to be content, but it's also a click through just to get to the site. And it's really important that it's relevant because if you bombard someone, I mean, some people actually, you may think you don't like to be bombarded, but if I bombard you, you'll actually behave the way I need you to. So it's, it's. <laughs> that sounds dirty a little bit. <laughs> Not dirty like that. Okay. Okay. Um, is there anything that's totally useless that you've tried? I useless. Mean, you know that you've done it and you've been like, ah, oh, that didn't work in, in social media or something. Nothing comes to mind. Are you guys big on Twitter? I'm just, I don't see a lot of. Uh, we have some things. I mean, I think individuals. Yeah. I, I don't do, I don't do that. But for Williams, for any of your brands. They have some things going on. Yeah. We're more focused on Instagram, Facebook. Instagram, Facebook. Pinterest. Pinterest. Love Pinterest. Hi there, uh, I'm Jamie Minnie from Slice Intelligence. Um, one of the things I have observed about you is you've been very innovative in terms of your partnerships with 
um, hotels. You, I think, did something with Airbnb. You did the in-store activations with Casper. What are some of the things that you've learned from, from this? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of people doing cool things, and um, one of, you know, our key um, mindsets is to is to make sure that we're bringing them in. So if somebody finds somebody doing something, we uh, we we partner with them. And you know, some of them are better than others. I'm I'm proud to tell you that we're going to be partnering with Harry Potter here with PBT in a couple weeks, and it's going to be phenomenal. There's no bigger audience than Harry Potter lovers. Wait, is there a new book? Just no, but um, maybe no. There's oh. I, it's that um, <laughs> we are we we're going to do the home. We're betting. And You're doing a Harry Potter home? Home, yeah. You wait till you see it. Is that your thing? No, not even slightly. <laughs> <It's> fantastic. <laughs> like, a, like. Betting. Betting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Wall decor. Wall decor. Yeah. Are the paintings going to talk to me? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, clocks. Look at you. Maybe. I don't know. Could be. Maybe. Um, next. It's going to be fabulous. Hi, my name is Marielle McGuire from Curtio Sponsored Products. Uh -huh. um, and there's not one brand that touches my life more than your brand. I sleep in your sheets, I oh, have your couches, I have everything. Um, so, pay her. <laughs> I had a question about your on site monetization and how you feel. Um, do you think that your on site monetization is successful at this point, or it's something that needs improvement, or you're very happy with it? And um, Amazon has headline search that they rolled out, and is that something that you'd ever see yourself kind of implementing on the sites? I think we, I think we have a lot of room for improvement in that area. Um, I'm going to say that when you ask me most questions, but um, right now I think our search should be better. We need to have voice. I mean, so you know, I, it's an area that there's a lot of opportunity. And I know that the only way I shop is search. And I, because I'm getting carpal tunnel, thanks to my phone, I am using voice constantly now. So um, those will come for us as quickly as I can get them done. All right. I think this is probably the last one. Yeah. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Chung, and I'm actually a retail consultant. And you talked a lot about home being a high-touch environment mm -hmm. and my question is, how are you making this more of a seamless experience for the customer? Because you said service is so important. You still have stores, um, but a lot of your business is direct online. So what are you doing to make it more of a seamless environment? And part of that, I'm asking also as a customer, because I've shopped in your stores. And you know, I think a lot of retail, traditional retailers are facing that challenge. Yeah, so um, there's a few things. You know, we, we, um, have made really, there's very simple changes um, in process um, and procedures. So for example, it used to be that you had to send all of the mail order internet product back to us. And now we're encouraging customers to bring them back to the store. I mean, that's obvious, but a lot of people still aren't doing that. Um, and the other one is we're launching buy online pick up in store, which I know the apparel people have been doing, but we, in the home world that hasn't happened. We're launching that for Williams-Sonoma this holiday. Why is that? Because the inventory issue of, of having it there? or Bigger cube, more difficult. Um, you know, that's my guess. So we're excited about it. We know it's, we know it's going to be worth a lot. It's what our customers are asking for. Three. Do you do the last one? Or? Uh, sure. Go ahead, real Make quick. Quick, please. Hi. Yeah, it's, it's quick. My name is Gray Tanaka. I'm with a company called Percolata. And my question for Laura is, um, given that you know, online business has become so strong, what do you think the role of the store associate is in the physical store, given that a lot of the transactional type of stuff has happened online? So you know, for the physical store, it's more experiential. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you see that in the role of the, of the store associate or sales associate in the physical store going forward. So our store associates, um, some of them do a million dollars a year in sales individually because, how, because of their relationships with their clients. And, um, you know, they are using the internet as a tool to show different looks, um, to research content, and they're very adept at doing that. As I said, we are even training people to use the Tango app that we built so they can show um, the customer it in 3D. And, um, you know, we have incredible associates. I mean, they are true believers. They are um, tech savvy, and they make a huge difference. In fact, oftentimes we accuse them of stealing the internet sales because 
<laughs> they make it so easy, they place the whole thing for you and then they follow up to make sure that it gets there on time and you know, together if they do a huge order for a whole house, for example. Do they know I have West Elm couches if I go into the store? And um, they can pull that up, yes. You can see the whole customer history online. Can I ask you one final question yeah. before we go? Yeah. If you had to pick another retailer that's doing things that are really cool, none, none of your brands, what, what do you see that you go, wow, that's pretty friggin' cool? I, I miss the... What, another retailer of things they're doing that, that are really cool. Huh. When, you, when you go, ugh, that's something I wish I had done. It's interesting to think about. Um, I could pitch my Fitbit, <laughs> which I'm on the board of. Uh, no, uh, you can't do that. I can't do that. I got it in though. Um, let's see. I, mean, I think I, I think a lot of people have pieces and parts that are that are interesting, right? I mean, um, getting out of the home world. You know, I um, I think Sephora. You know, great, fantastic. Ulta too. I, I mean, I love the innovation in the cosmetics industry. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Great. All right. Okay, Thank great. you so much. Thanks, Laura. Laura.